I try to, it's gonna, it's recording now, I believe. And I don't know why that did it because I did it exactly like, but um, that's great. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce our first speaker who's gonna give us an overview on grapevine biology. Jim O'Connell is the um, grape and berry specialist in the Hudson Valley. And um, Jim, thank you so much. Sure. All right, so uh, apologies, uh, let me get the right annotation thing here, okay. So hopefully everyone can see this little laser pointer on my screen. So Laura asked me today to uh, give a couple talks. The first one is about grapevine biology. Hopefully pretty simple, I uh, hope I didn't get your technical. Um, so let's uh, give it a go here. So an overview of the structure of the grapevine. So you kind of, you know, your soil and what's coming out of the soil here, this is your trunk. Um, these permanent structures here coming up off the trunk and folding laterally, laterally down onto the wires are the cordons. Your uh, kind of center area right here, this is the, the crown. And, and then these uh, sections coming off, you know, these ones right here are actually fruiting spurs. So these are, you know, two or three buds. Your um, fruiting canes would, you know, be longer, you know, maybe, you know, 10, 12 buds, uh, so it would look pretty similar, just a little you know, longer and extended out. So the purpose of the trunk, uh, the trunk really uh, connects your um, the canopy, so your your cordons, your uh, canes, your fruiting spurs, uh, with the you know, the soil and you know the roots and the soil and the nutrients that are, the roots are absorbing. So the uh, you know the um, roots take everything up, comes up through the trunk. And then gets distributed into um, the cordons, the fruiting spurs, and then in, you know later in the season into the shoots and in the fruits. So with the with uh, with grapevines, uh, you, know, you have buds. So on the on the canes, uh, on the fruiting spurs, even along the uh, the trunk, you have buds. And the picture here is what you you can see is typical grape bud. Looks like a pretty simple structure. It's you know, you know, swollen. And, um, it looks like any other fruiting bud or any other bud that you see on plants. But when you cut it open, you can actually see that it's a, a compound structure. So it's comprised of, of three individual buds you know, underneath uh, uh, this, uh, this layer, this exterior layer. So this big fat one in the center is the uh, primary bud. And that's really what's going to give you the best crop and it's going to produce the highest quality of grapes. If something happens to that bud, if uh, you know disease, your insect injury, or if uh, it gets um, injured through frost, <clears throat> you have two other buds. You have a secondary bud right here, which is a little bit smaller. That'll still give you a crop. It'll still be a quality crop. It is just uh, it won't be as high as quality as the as the primary as what you get from the primary bud. And typically, you're going to see about a two to three week delay in in, in um, fruit maturity development because it takes longer for that bud to emerge then longer for the the flowers to come out and so everything gets delayed the last bud which it's hard to see in this picture it's right underneath my laser pointer right there it's it's very small maybe and this picture looks about the size of a pinhead that's your tertiary bud tertiary bud really just keeps the plant alive so if, you, if um worst case scenario well, worst case scenario everything would be dead so second worst case scenario your primary bud and your secondary 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 bud sorry are dead you're left with the tertiary bud that'll keep the vine alive it's just going to be vegetative only and you'll you'll be able to save the vine be able to get something next year and buds your your buds so what's on here is, is initiated the previous season so kind of you know the chicken well, you know, what comes first your chicken or egg kind of thing so you go through the growing season well and you have your uh, everything, you know, flowers, fruits, and the end of the season when the foliage drops off, you know, your buds or your fruiting buds are initiated then for the growing season that comes afterwards. So jumping from the structure into the phenology and the first thing, kind of thing that happens, so you, you, the picture I showed you before where you had the buds and then your buds swell and you go through various stages of the buds swell. What happens immediately afterwards and what kind of you know gets the season going is the bud burst and that's what you see in this picture here right the previous picture the previous picture you know had a little bud it was you know, maybe about the size of a uh, pointer fingernail it was a little you know somewhat swollen so now that bud has opened up and you have this nice uh, shoot that's starting to develop here the um this, the bud swell happens in early spring you know after you've done all the pruning 
and like I said, it's the season opener. It's what gets things started. The vines are, are starting to waken up, and so then also the pests are starting to emerge as well. And it kind of signals, that's uh, a stage where we signal for when we need to start treating for uh, pests, uh, insect pests and disease pests. Uh, so normally late spring, so this is, you know, relative to your, to your region. And in the Hudson Valley, in the lower Hudson Valley, Ulster County, where I am, this is typically about early May. But based on your region, again, the temperatures, it can definitely vary. Moving along from bud burst, we, uh, you go through bud burst, you get the shoot development, and the next you know, major um, important stage of phenology is bloom. What I have here is true pictures. And so this is kind of... This top one here is what you'll see in kind of in the field. Um, this is generally what it's going to look like. It's a, probably a little bit closer up, maybe if you're looking through a magnifying glass. And what you can see is that the flowers are very inconspicuous. They're not showy. So they're not these beautiful, bright flowers like you see in a morning glory. They're very uh, small, inconspicuous, uh, inconspicuous. And the petals are, are actually fused together in a, in a, into a structure uh, that's you know, commonly known as a cap. So you can see that right here. The, you know, the technical term is a, is a calyptra, um, but everybody, growers all, all just call it a cap. And in uh, commercial production, you know, your majority of vines that you're going to buy, uh, the flowers are going to be perfect, meaning that they have you know, male and female organs. So you have your, your anthers and your stamens and your, your pistil and your stigmas. And the reason that's important is because in a, um, one vine with male and female flowers, everything is wind pollinated, it's not insect pollinated. So we, going back to how these flowers are inconspicuous and that they're pollinated by wind. Um, so the wind blows, it moves the pollen from your, your, uh, your male parts to your female parts, um, they, you know, it gets uh, fertilized and then it starts developing you know, the fruit which comes into you, develops your grape. And the period of bloom, you know, so the open flower period of bloom is you know, about one to three weeks depending on the weather. Uh, full bloom. So what we consider full bloom is really, you know, when 50% or two thirds of these caps have fallen. So these, you know, structures here that are you know, fused together, um, when when half or two thirds of these fall off, uh, we consider that full bloom. So moving from bloom to veraison. Veraison, uh, veraison is a, a French word, and, and for us it denotes the onset of ripening. So that would be, you know, the color change. You see in this picture where you have these these fruit here are still, you know, green, fairly unripe, and you see this purplish, uh, it is purple shade on the fruits, um, that's for raisin. So it's not a, uh, it's, it's not completely dark. You can see like this one here where there's still a little bit of green and it's actually moving into purple. So it's a color change of both the skin and the seeds. So your, your skin is going for, for um, red grapes. So your purple grapes is going from green to, you know, the red or, you know, that purple color. Uh, green grapes is going more from a green to um, kind of like a you know yellow yellowish green, and this typically happens about sixty to seventy days after bloom, depending on the varieties and depending also you know, maybe a little bit on weather. Uh, weather you know if you get a warm period and then it gets sort of very cold, it can, after that it can slow things down a little bit. And at this point, your your energy, so the vine energy, so all the nutrients, things that the roots are taking up, distributing through the trunk, distributing through the arms, and, and all of the shoots. Uh, is actually being diverted into the clusters. And so that, uh, those carbohydrates are, you know, are, are, are coming into the fruit to increase the sugar, and it's also softening the fruit. So the fruit starts off very hard in the beginning of the season, hard and green, and then it moves along and, and starts to soften up and, and change color to this purple. And raisin takes time. You know, when, you, when you're growing things, when, you, when you're growing the crop, and you're, you're in there day after day, and by the end of the season, you kind of look around and like, wow, you know, this... This, this happens so fast, it still takes time. Even, you know, even when you, you look at it that way, the, the season went quickly, you're still looking about six to eight weeks uh, for um, full development of ripening, depending on the, the variety that you're, you're growing. So moving from raisin, we go into harvest. And, you know, you see here, in contrast to the previous picture where uh, we had some green fruit and some that were just turning purple, uh, these are all, you know, pretty much color changed. Uh, you know, this is... Um, uh, the skin is, uh, you know, fully, uh, fully developed in color. And I don't show it in the picture, but I know by breaking the, the, the fruit open, the, the seeds are a nice, uh, you know, dark brown color. Uh, three popular um, table grape varieties here, Canadice, Himrod, and Mars. So when we harvest, uh, we harvest based on uh, sugar levels or bricks. 
So cannabis, you're looking, you're looking at a very sweet grape, you're looking at a very high um, sugar content of 20 bricks. Imrod, you know, very similar. You're looking between 21 and 22 bricks, so a little bit higher than cannabis. And Mars, um, you know, Mars is on the, on the lower end of sweet, you know, 15 to 17 bricks. The reason we would look at the sugar levels that we actually calculated out on a, you know, on a refractometer, uh, something that measures the, the, uh, the sugar levels for us, is because it might taste sweet to us. So we might, you know, pull, um, everyone's, everyone, everyone is different. We might pull a grape off, it might taste sweet to us. Next person who you know, pulls it off, it might taste very sweet to them. But given this standardized range, we know that this is really when the fruit is ripe and this is when it's optimal uh, for, for customer satisfaction. Uh, and then harvest, the, you know, so for raisin is a six to eight week period and harvest usually starts um, you know, sometime in, in late summer and goes through early fall. So you're looking at, um, you know, uh, typically in my region, end of August and going somewhere from, uh, you know, September to early October. Now, some varieties are, are early, so you have, you know, basically early, mid-season and in late varieties, which uh, can extend things out nicely for you. So a quick presentation, I know, um, and just to kind of sum it up a little bit here. Uh, grapes are a perennial crop, so the, you know, we plant these in the ground, and it's a vine. Uh, perennial, you're looking at the, the, at least a 10-year lifespan. Um, is, this is assuming you know, everything goes well. Uh, frost doesn't get to them. Uh, voles, insects, pests, you know, don't get to them. Um, everything goes well. And you're looking at, you know, 10 plus year lifespan on them. Your bud burst, um, you know, so bud burst to blooms, that stage of phenology, you're probably looking about, you know, one to two months. Uh, from bloom to harvest, so from when the, the caps fall, 50%, two thirds of the caps fall to when the fruit is completely ripe, and you're looking in about four to five months. And then after that, uh, you're looking at dormancy, so you, you harvest the fruit, uh, the temperatures get colder, the leaves drop, and the vines go into dormancy, and they set buds for the following season. And Laura, I'm not sure if we have time for questions or if you're, if you're answering the, the chat box and you just want to go on to the next one. Um, we don't have a ton of questions. We don't have any questions right now, and we don't have a ton of time. So unless somebody, if you want to get my attention to folks, you can actually raise your hand. There's that little option for that next to your in the participant category, which might allow us to do some kind of verbal questions, which might be quicker for some of you. But at this point, you're all muted successfully, and I think we'll just move on um, because we do have a rather short time period. Um, our next uh, presenter is Liz Higgins. Liz is our Farm Business Management Specialist with the Eastern New York Commercial Hort Program. It's a regional program. Um, that is sponsored by Cornell Cooperative Extension. And she has, uh, she's gonna talk to us about marketing and business management concerns. So thank you, Liz. Liz, you have to uh, unmute yourself. Okay, can you guys see the presentation? Yes, we can. It says marketing table grapes. There's your cover slide and it looks great. Okay, good. I couldn't tell. I have two screens and it went onto the different screens. So it, it threw me off. Okay, okay. great. As, uh, Laura said, as Laura said, I'm um, the Ag Business Management Specialist and um, this is going to be a very quick overview of marketing table grapes. Um, so, you know, this is necessarily just going to sort of be the tip of the iceberg um, and hopefully it'll give you sort of an overall view. Um, and if you have other questions later on, feel free to contact me or contact Laura and we'd be willing to go into more depth with you. Um, so what I wanna cover is really the elements of the, the business, looking at enterprise budgets to get a sense of what you would need financially to get into table grapes. Um, some discussion about um, really, you know, we're gonna talk a lot in this class about producing table grapes. Um, and that's really where a lot of people want to be, but you know, it's also really important to consider harvesting, post-harvesting, and marketing the table grapes, and then um, a little bit about business plans. Um, so as I said, you know, this is where most of you guys want to be, is growing the crop. This is my experience with farmers. Everybody's excited about growing grapes, but it's also really, really, really important to think about how you're going to sell the crop and harvest and process the crop, because as you'll learn, you know, they're all going to ripen at once, these grapes, and you've got to be ready to do something with them. Um, so 
when you're thinking about any enterprise, whether it's table grapes or, or, or whatever else, you kind of need to look at um, whether you have the resources available to you or can get the resources to make it a viable business. Um, you know, in economics, we talk about land, labor, and capital really as being the, the primary um, different types of resources you need. Um, land, especially for great production, is really important. As when we look at the enterprise budget, you'll get a sense of, you know, the quality of your land is really going to have an impact on your even starting costs. Um, labor, you know, at, at various times for labor is really critical for great production because there are going to be key points during the year where you're going to need access probably to a labor force, whether it's your own labor or hired labor, and you're going to need it like right there, right at that time. And if you can't get it, you're going to have a real problem. Um, I had a guy call me one time who had like 2000 grapevines coming and he didn't have anybody to plant them. He hadn't really thought about that. Um, and so where could he get like five or six people to plant these grapevines? Um, so that's, you know, that's really, really, really important. And then capital, um, you know, do you have access to good credit? Do you have access to resources? Um, grapes, um, as you'll see, are um, a crop that takes several years before you really start seeing any return on your investment. And so you really need to be able to think about, can you keep yourself going um, while you're waiting for the crop to come in? Um, this is a, you know, I'm going to give you an enterprise budget for table grapes, but I also want you to be um, really, you know, these numbers are really going to vary depending on your personal situation. Uh, the University of Kentucky uh, does have a really nice enterprise budget for table grapes and a, um, a lot of some, a lot of information on table grape production. So it's for the Northeast, it was one of the better um, resources that I was able to find. Cornell, um, the Dyson School does have enterprise budgets for cold hardy grapes and other grapes, but there's more of an emphasis on wine grapes and juice grapes um, for their budgets. And, and they're, it's also predicated on growing more acres. So even though they'll give a budget that's based on one acre, there's an assumption that you're doing 20 to 30 acres there. And some of the, the labor and fixed cost assumptions, because they're really going to be spread out over more acres may not be um, relevant to somebody who's only going to be doing table grapes on like a half acre or whatever. In that case, I actually think the University of Kentucky um, information is a little bit more relevant just because it's sort of predicated on a really small scale uh, table grape production system. Um, but given that, um, when you look at year one for grape production, the key thing I want you to notice here is that um, land, the land that you buy is really going to make a big difference because year one is all land prep. So if you need to really adjust the pH of that property, you're going to pay a lot more for lime or fertilizers. That could be very variable. But the big one is drainage. Um, you know, so if you have a, a property that has really good drainage, it's really well set up, that $3,000 assumption, you know, could be closer to zero. If you really need to invest a lot in a drainage system, it could be higher. And so this is where spending a little bit more time thinking about site can save you some significant upfront costs. Um, year two is the establishment of the, the um, of the system in, in the area where, you know, you're going to see the greatest um, sort of impacts are going to be around um, labor costs. Um, the trellis system and repairs, a lot of the costs in there are materials, but there's also some labor costs embedded in there. Um, and planting and replacement vines, um, most of the cost, about $2,000 of that cost is the vines, but, you know, some of that cost is also labor costs. And so, to the extent that you're either doing it yourself or hiring it or whatever your labor costs are, um, that could really impact your upfront costs. And then year three is also pre-production. Um, and so this one is gonna be more, um, you don't have any big out-of-pocket costs. It's just gonna be overall like what kind of um, cultivation do you need? What kind of soil amendments are you still needing to add? Um, so it's a lower cost year overall compared to the first two where you're really having to invest a lot in getting the site ready. But the key thing to notice is for those first three years, there's no revenue coming in. You know, so you're laying out over $10,000 in three years 
on an acre and not seeing any revenue come in. And so you need to be able to finance that or support that somehow. Um, year four, you know, or year three, if you buy a site that's in really good shape right up front, is your first year of production generally, but it's not your first mature, like full production. Um, Kentucky assumed that you got about 2,500 pounds off that acre. Um, other people here um, will be more able to tell you whether that's realistic or not for our region. Um, I'm not a grape specialist, but in general, you'll assume that that third year of like actually having grapes in the ground, you'll get some production, but not full production. Um, and so, but you're also starting to see higher chemical costs. You're going to see some harvesting and packing costs. Um, you need to plan for things like uh, cool. The other thing that went up a lot is fixed costs, because at this point, you're really going to need a cooler. If you're going to be marketing grapes, they're really perishable. Um, and you're going to need crates and packaging to put them in. Um, so there's some really some added expenses there. Um, so of the total costs, um, this year, about half your costs are actually in harvesting and packing types of costs. Um, and that is pretty consistent there out that harvesting and packing um, are going to be a lot of your bigger costs in, in table grape production because there's such a um, perishable crop and a crop that takes a lot of hand labor for, you know, for picking and for management. Um, so, you know, in the year five is where you're going to theoretically see full production if everything goes swimmingly. And that's where you're going to start seeing, hopefully, some profit. Um, so we're assuming, you know, I've assumed $2 a pound for, for table grapes. Um, you may be able to get more in some areas. Um, you may get less. I looked at wholesale table grape prices um, and some retail prices. Um, so your mileage may vary, but so this is sort of an average conservative amount. Um, when you're doing your enterprise budget, you're better off assuming just so you're not disappointed, a little bit lower production and a bit lower revenue, assuming that there's going to be some loss as you're getting going. Um, and then you're more likely to actually see a profit and feel happy. Whereas if you assume that you're going to sell everything at top dollar and, and you build your, your expectations around that, you're more likely to, to actually be disappointed. Um, so with that, you know, for table grapes, you're really looking at both direct markets, you know, CSAs, um, um, what do you call the farmer's markets um, or wholesale markets would be another market um, for table grapes. Um, and with wholesale markets, you know, you're going to have more concern about things like packaging, like um, quality in harvesting so that you can actually keep the, the product um, at a high quality longer because your turnaround time between when you get it off the field and when it gets to a consumer will be longer. And so how you, you take care of those grapes right up front will be, make much more of a difference. Um, you know, so you're really looking um, for marketing with direct markets, as I said, like roadside stands, CSAs, pick your owns. This is probably where you'll get the top dollar per unit, um, you know, compared to the wholesale markets um, or value added um, for, the, for the grape itself. But as we'll talk about in a minute, you know, there are limitations. Um, value added for grapes, um, you know, you're, this is one where you're, you, know, you know, you can clearly do grape jam, you could do grape jelly. It's not as flexible a crop necessarily as some other fruit might be as far as having a lot of obvious uses to consumers. And then there's wholesale markets, um, restaurants, um, local schools, wholesale markets and stuff. And there's some opportunities and challenges with each, each of these markets. Um, you're looking at a really highly seasonal crop with table grapes. So they're, everybody's grapes are going to be out right about the same time. Um, and they're really perishable. And so a local market could really be easy. If everybody got into table grapes in a region, your local market would get really flooded unless you can really get people to eat a lot of grapes. Um, and so that's just something to be concerned about is how many other people around you are doing table grapes and are they selling all their grapes? Is there excess demand in that local market? Um, you know, especially when you're looking at a, a three to five year time lag between your grapes would hit the market. 
Um, but you don't, you know, we do a lot of un more unusual varieties that you might not see in a store. And so you don't have, for direct markets, maybe tons of direct retail competition. You know, you've got like sort of standard California grapes and, you know, our varieties might be different. And so that might be something that, you know, you have an advantage with. Um, so for value added, as I said, you've got kind of limited products that people think of using table grapes. And so this is going to be one where you're going to have to really um, be creative. Um, you're adding different labor and costs and added regulation, but it's the only option that you've got for long-term storage of your crop. Um, because this is not a crop that you can just sort of sit on for a while. So if you've got a lot of excess product, making juice, making jam, finding some other uses for it really is the only way you're going to be able to do anything with it beyond that immediate short-term period. And then wholesale markets, you know, you really are going to have to up your game with a wholesale market around harvesting, packaging, and handling. Um, and it's, you know, uncertain demand. This is not one of those crops that um, you necessarily have tons of wholesale buyers for unless you're really, um, plugged in. Um, and then markets can also be season are seasonally flooded, you know, and prices in wholesale markets in the fall when your grapes would hit a wholesale market are going to be about the lowest they're going to be because you're looking, you know, you've got, you've got a seasonality problem. Um, but it's a potential for you if your local markets are saturated, wholesale markets may be an opportunity for you to hit other consumers than you can hit in a local region. Um, but the key thing here is do not grow more grapes than you can sell um, because, you know, you, they're expensive to grow and they're very perishable. Um, if you're looking at wholesale markets, one thing I would encourage is to look at partnering with other table grape growers to access markets rather than expanding your acres. Um, if you're in an area where a lot of people are interested and you've, you've got some other growers because you know, you're, you've got, because you've got this time lag and because you do may, may have this marketing issue, finding somebody to like explore wholesale markets with um, may be a way for both of you to have an opportunity to hit other markets um, rather than you taking on all of the risks yourself of trying to expand your acres and, and hit those wholesale markets um, from the beginning. Um, hand out recipes and samples. You really want to get people to eat a lot of grapes. Um, I will give California Table Grape Commission credit. They've got probably the best table grape recipes out there. So if you're going to market table grapes and you're going to markets and stuff or to restaurants, go with some recipes. Show people some really innovative things you can do with grapes beyond eating them raw and grape jelly. I mean, you really want to get people to see grapes as like this, this food that they can do a lot of stuff with. Um, so the other thing is, is if you're going to get into great production, you really have to be not just concerned, and we're only, it seems like we're mostly talking about production here, but post-harvest packing and grading is going to be really, really, really important. You need to, um, if you're going to keep your grapes in really good condition, you've got to keep them cool. You've got to store them at the right temperature. You've got to plan to get cooling equipment in a cooler. Um, and there are guidelines if you're new to grapes. Um, UC Davis and, and ARS Handbook 66, um, it's the same information. Um, UC Davis developed this, but this is where you can find information about what table grapes need um, to maintain quality and storage. Um, and so I would definitely look at that. Um, New York does have grade standards for grapes. And so if you, um, you are required in New York if you are not grading your grapes, and there really are standards for how you grade them, um, you, you're supposed to mark the package ungraded. Um, so you don't have to grade them, but you have to indicate that they're not graded. Um, and then the USDA has voluntary grade standards for grapes. Um, and these are the links to find out about what you need to do um, as far as, especially if you're going to go to wholesale markets or to restaurants, understanding what a quality grape is and, and what different quality standards are around grape production. Um, and so where do you get data? I mean, that's always the question um, that people have if you're trying to do an enterprise budget or you're trying to do a marketing budget. Um, you know, so catalogs, you know, for equipment, ag production supply companies, 
um, trade shows. Um, it's interesting. You know, I was just at Ag Expo a few weeks ago. Um, but you can talk to, you know, packaging suppliers, um, labeling suppliers, equipment dealers. I'm um, really, you know, just getting out there and sort of seeing what's available. Other farmers, um, commodity grower association. So like the New York Berry Growers Association, um, the Grape Growers Association. These are good resources also. Um, for prices, um, for market research, you know, go around to farmer's markets and farm stands and, you know, retail stores and get a sense that what people are look, selling grapes for. Um, for retail, just as a rule of thumb, retail prices tend to be 33 to 50% markup from wholesale price. So if you go to a grocery store and you see that grapes are about $3 a pint in a grocery store, you can sort of, as a rule of thumb, guess that you're looking at about $1.50 a pint for budgeting purposes. Um, you might get a little bit more and you might get a little bit less. The stores tend to pay less of that percentage, so like more closer to the 33% for things that um, won't move or that, that might go bad quickly. And because grapes are perishable, I definitely, um, you know, you might want to be a little conservative, but it would give you a sense of what you can get. Um, and on the other hand, a retail store might give a little bit more if it's a, an interesting variety that there might be demand for. So um, that might be a way. Um, Ag Marketing Service for USDA, and um, they also give, whole, you can get wholesale and farmer's market prices of different crops. Um, you know, so it gives you kind of an idea of what the prices are. Um, your price that you get in your local area may be higher um, then these, but at least for budgeting purposes, gives you a sense of, you know, what's more likely to be realistic once you get above a certain volume of product. Um, okay, so writing a business plan, you'll find that more and more in order to get um, financial assistance or, um, you know, from a bank or um, for grants or whatever, that you need to have a business plan. Um, but the, the, even more important than writing a business plan is really doing actual market research and legwork, getting these prices, figuring out what you have. Um, you know, you can write a business plan with reg really, you could just take these enterprise budgets from universities and stick them in as your business plan. But unless you go and do some ground truthing about what the real market is, what the real prices are, what the real demand is, um, you know, it's all just theory. Like all these numbers I gave you are really just theory. You need to figure out where you are with what you have, what your labor environment is, what your real costs and what your real revenue is likely to be. Um, and then, but what business plans can do is that they can help you get feedback from others. So you could put together what you think the numbers are and take them to other people and say, do these seem reasonable given what you know? Um, and you will need a business plan if you're going to go and get a loan or go get funding from somebody. So it, that's really important. Um, they definitely should be short. They should focus on your business, um, your qualifications. Um, they show that you know what you want to do, and they show that you have thought about how you're going to manage different scenarios. And they should show that you've got enough cash to keep your business going during especially the startup period, um, either that you've got another job or you've got another like sources of revenue, um, because especially with something like grape production, you are gonna have that lag in startup, and so you're gonna have to show that you can cover those costs long enough in order to get to the point where you're actually seeing some revenue. Um, if you do need to write a business plan, the University of Minnesota offers Ag Plan, um, it's a free annotated program to help guide you through the steps of writing a business plan. Um, and it also really allows for nice formatting and adding attachments. Um, the final plan can be shared um, with other technical assistance providers to get feedback. Um, you can print it out or save it as a PDF or Word document. So it's a really nice um, resource. It's probably one of the best um, business plan sort of assistance websites that I've seen or tried to use. Um, so with that, I think I'm done. All right, thanks Liz. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box right now. Uh, is anybody got any questions for Liz or even Jim, if you've thought of other questions? 
I, I do want to um, explain, I think the business management portion is so important to success. So that's why we put this right in the beginning. Um, we know from teaching beginning farmer classes a lot that it's not hard to talk to folks about growing things. There's a lot of people out there that really enjoy that. But in order to kind of um, improve your opportunity for success, the business management considerations are huge. The next really important thing is site selection. And um, Jim O'Connell is going to come back and talk to us about that. Um, and Jim, do you mind sharing your screen again? I think you can, can you guys yep, see working on that? Okay. Great, it's <laughs> so quiet there. Perfect. Yeah, let me just put this in the presentation. There we go. All right, All right. thank you. All set? Yep. Okay, so as Laura said, in vineyard site selection, I'm gonna cruise through, because there was a couple of slides that overlap with, with Liz's presentation. So uh, site selection is probably the most important thing probably next to your, your business, what you're going to do with selling your crop um, when it comes to production. So understand nothing is perfect. <clears throat> Even the best sites are going to need work. And you have to understand that it's going to take time and money to make these improvements. So your improvements cost money. Yeah, it's easier to get these things done before you, you start planning. If you put the vines in the ground and you try and fix problems after the fact, it's going to take you a lot longer. You're going to run into issues and it's going to take you more money. <clears throat> when, you're, when you're thinking about the, um, you're producing grapes, you want to look long-term, uh, you know, even on the, the site selection side of things. So is it just going to be, are you just going to plant the crop? Is that all you're going to have at your site? Do you need any buildings? Are there buildings on the site? What about uh, access to, you know, to the location, you know, regardless of whether or how you're selling your grapes? Um, you need to be able to get to the site and you need others to be able to get to your site. And so if it's, uh, if, if it's not easy to get there, if it's not easy to find, uh, that can you know, limit what, what you're going to do. And then, uh, you know, know your market. Uh, Liz was pretty clear about uh, when you're selling the grapes, uh, you have to identify where you're going to sell them, what you're going to sell them for, and, and what you're going to do with them. So pick your own retail wholesale. These are all things to consider. <clears throat> grapes are a perennial crop. Up. Uh, it's going to take you, you know, four to five years before you're going to see any return on that investment. And you have, you know, one or two years of prep, two to three years before your first crop. So you, yeah, you're thinking about growing grapes. I mean, first, probably one of your first steps uh, is locate a potential site. You know, so where is this? And uh, I realize I don't have my uh, laser pointer here. Um, so. I use this as an example. This is the, the Hudson Valley Research Lab on 9W. And so it's, it's a site that's near the road. And it's not in the middle of nowhere. It's by a major intersection, so people you know, drive by it a lot. And so it's something to consider. You know, where are you going to put your site? Uh, when, you know, what's its location? Uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's nearby? Uh, site history is important. What was grown there? Um, you know, uh, what's gonna, how's that going to impact on what you grow? So were there vegetables grown there before? Uh, was there some other fruit growing there before? Will the pests that affected those plants affect your grapes? And then drainage, you know, are you in an area where it's going to get wet? Uh, it's going to get wet. Are you potentially in a floodplain? You know, something you want to identify before you, you know, you, you buy the site before you start planting. And then, you know, like Liz said, what are you going to do with the crop? You know, well, I want to sell it. That's great. How are you going to sell it? Are you going to do value added? Is it going to be, you know, fresh market? Uh, things to think of, with, you know, with access to your site. You think you have an idea of a site? You know, let's take a closer look at it. Uh, this is the top one here with the orange circles, uh, an actual site I went to for a uh, farm visit. Looks pretty good. It's pretty clear. This area right here, this is the kind of the uh, upper portion of the field. Uh, some trees had grown in and they're actually shading this section of the field. And you know, walking the field with the grower, this is something I told him he's gonna have to correct this because while the, this open area here gets plenty of sunlight, Anything up here is going to be shaded, and then these trees are going to serve as an obstruction. You want to get rid of them. You know, what, do you, what do you have for water? What, what kind of access do you have for water? Well, here's, a, here's another site from a grower. This is on the bottom half of this field, but you can see there's, you know, there's a pond here, there's another pond here, and then this looks pretty, pretty wet here. So they're, they're in a pretty good shape for, you know, for irrigation. Uh, what about the soil for uh, you know, drainage and texture? Well, Situation like this, you can see in this orange circle, this puddle of water, 
if you really don't want that, that's, that's going to take time to correct that. You'll have to put drainage tile in there to remove that excess water. And then texture. This is another bad situation here. We're in this bucket. We, um, you, when you actually get into the soil and you find that it's very compacted and, and it comes out in clumps like that, something that you really don't want, it's correctable, but it, it's going to take time. And then soil depth. If you're if you go down six inches and you hit ledge, um, is your soil beneath that, or you're gonna have to break up that ledge? You're really looking for 18 to 24 inches, and in, in you're kind of a minimum to get you for uh, suitable grapevines, uh, suitable soil for grapevines. So what else you need to know about your site? Well, getting a little more technical, a little more into it, and looking at growing the green days. Table grapes you know, tend to be mid-season, late grapes. So you're looking, you know, 2,500 growing degree days, base 50. So minimum number of days at a minimum number of hours at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So you need 2,500 of that total. In the Hudson Valley at the, at the, the, at the lab, so the site I showed you on the previous slide, from April 1st to September 30th, on beta, growing degree base 50, we had over 3,000 growing degree days. So it's fine for a site like that is fine for that. About seasonal lows, Hudson Valley, you know, we typically see minus 10, minus 15. You go north, north of Albany, you start getting into Champlain Valley, minus 20, you know, what else, do, how low, how further low does it get? Maybe minus 30 some years, it, it gets pretty cold up there. You want to take that into consideration. Slope, you want to remove, you want something with good slope to remove air drainage. You don't want too much of a slope because that you know, it leads to erosion. And it can also be concerns with safety. So you, 10% uh, is fine, 10 to 15% is okay. <clears throat> Anything more than 15%, there's concerns about erosion and concerns about safety when using equipment. And low spots, so low spots go along with drainage. If there's you know, pockets where, you know, where it dips down and, there's, and the drainage is very good, the cold air is gonna settle there and you're gonna get frost in there. Water collection is gonna settle in the low spots as well. So the things to consider, things to correct. Aspect is the way the vines are going to face, the way the field runs, and the way the vines are planted and facing the sun. If everything faces north and your vines are going to face north, it's going to be too cold. It's not, it's not good. East to west is good. They, you know, they get the morning sun. And the sun moves around, and then as, uh, as it you know, sets in the south, the, the, the vines are already, have already got, they gotten their, their warmth and the heat for the day. So by the time the day warms up, um, they're good to go, and the sun sets. They, they've gotten enough, enough sun. South is a good site. You know, south is you know, something we would use for uh, things that are very late maturing. Most of the time we use it in late maturing wine grapes. Table grapes, you know, probably, uh, you'd probably be fine with an east to west orientation or east to west aspect, sorry. And then frost free days. So the number of days that uh, the temperature stays above frost, 180 is, is kind of your minimal. And below that, you start, uh, it starts getting a little, a little bit short of a season. So available resources. So what, what as a potential grower are resources that you can use? A cooperative extension where a phone call, email away. Some people that sometimes you're right around the corner from one of our offices. Google Earth, that's great. You can load it online. You can look at things, uh, look at sites uh, online. You have uh, two different soil websites, um, the Solar Resource Lab and Soil Web uh, do the same thing. And, um, you, you put in their site and take you to the, the maps. You can look at what type of soil they have there. Cover crops, the Cornell website that tells you what cover crops will work for particular issues and what you, know, what you, can, uh, what you can plant. Um, what else? And you have the vineyard sites uh, selection here. So this tells you um, temperatures, uh, gives you a picture overlay, uh, and then tells you a lot about the potential site that you're looking at. So physical preparation, uh, things that you need to get done. You need soil tests and tests for nutrients, pH. You have to you know, rip it, plow it, till it, so get the you know, field ready for planting. Do you need to fumigate it? What about you know, amendments, so lime, manure, compost, cover crops, uh, things, you need to, things you need to prep the soil with? Who's going to do it? Are you doing it yourself? Do you have airwall equipment you can do it, do it with? Do you need to borrow equipment? Do you need to rent equipment? Are you experienced? And basically, the same thing goes for whoever else is doing it. If you're not going to do it, are you going to hire someone? Is it going to be a friend, a neighbor? Is it going to be a contractor? Do they have the experience with it? These are important considerations. If you, if you don't know what you're doing, if they don't know what they're doing, you need to find somebody who knows what they're doing. Ideal pH range, you know, typically you're looking in this range of about 6.2. Um, 
higher than that. So higher than you know, higher than six point two, when you start getting in the six five seven range, it starts uh, causing some the pH starts getting a little bit too high and starts limiting some of the nutrients. So this uh, six point two range is, is a pretty sweet spot. So in the meantime, uh, so while you're working on identifying the site and prepping the site and uh, everything else that goes along with uh, the business, you want to think about ordering the vines and getting ready to you know, plant them. So what kind of vines do you want? What varieties? Is it everything going to be early? Do you want early and mid? Do you want maybe everything late season? And then preparations to plant these. So the materials that you need to plant them with. So other than equipment, you're going to need in, the, in this picture here, these are actually grow tubes and these help uh, create a greenhouse effect and help promote the, the growth of the vine. So you're going to need grow tubes, some irrigation, you're going to need bamboo stakes for the first year. So these are all things to kind of supplies to order, things to get ready in preparation for planting. So trying to sum it all up here, you, you first want to locate a potential site and then do some research. So is it in a good area? Is it going to work for you? Is it going to work for whatever, whoever your customers are going to be? You're looking at the site a little bit closer, so you found something you think may work. Take a closer look at it, figure out what you need needs to be done with it, and if it's going to be practical. So is it going to cost you too much to manage it? It's going to be better to get a site someplace else. Yes, site area, everything you get, every site is going to need work. Is it within your budget? Is it within the timeline? So you want to start producing within five years. You have a market you have identified you know, where you can sell your grapes. Will that site work for you? Is there going to be too much that you need to get done that's going to hold up your timeline? Everything works out. You've, you've, done, you've, you've done all your research. Everything checks out okay. Sign on the dotted line, purchase your property, and then decide when and what to plant. And some useful links, uh, some uh, the uh, uh, Cooperative Extension Ulster in Eastern New York, the Vineyard Site Evaluation, and a few other things that I, I went over in here. And this will be, the web, webinar will be saved, so you can always Let's go back uh, to uh, download these links. And I'll turn it back over to Laura. All right, thank you very much, Jim. And I know we've already had some questions about getting copies, uh, maybe PDFs of the PowerPoint. This, um, this class is not affiliated with Moodle. We didn't uh, use that platform to store all the fact sheets and everything, which maybe we should have. But we didn't. So at this point, there's only about 40 people registered. So I think what I'll do is try to send resources directly to you, um, fact sheets and um, the link to the recording and things like that will go out through email. And I do want to, before I forget and before I introduce our last speaker, just remind folks that check your, check your spam box or your clutter box or whatever. Sometimes, um, these kinds of emails get lost because I've had a bunch of people that didn't get the email. So I'm thinking that the connection email might be laying somewhere else in your email stream. Um, uh, again, is, is there any questions on site selection? I'm not seeing any. Okay, why don't I introduce our last speaker. I'm really very happy to have Andy Farmer join us. Um, Andrew is the president and um, owner of the Northeastern Vine Supply Company, which is a grape nursery. He's also a farmer um, and does a um, lot of innovative things with grapes. And um, I'm just really happy to have him. So right now, Andy, I can see your presentation in, um, it's like not in the, just go to the, from the beginning, right over to the left on the top and click that and okay. there can you perfect. Me? perfect all right <clears throat> um so uh i'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective here on on uh table grape growing um so i grow some table grapes in a high tunnel over in vermont and i'll give you just a little bit of farm history so you can see how i got to this uh, I started uh, operating this grapevine nursery in 2002, uh, where we propagate and sell uh, cold hardy grapevines um, to growers all around the country. Um, that's a little view of one of our nursery fields over on the right there. And so the majority of what I do is producing bare root stock in the field. 
Um, but I started also growing potted greenhouse vines in 2005. And before that, I spent uh, a lot of years in the tree fruit industry. Uh, I spent some time working on vegetable farms even before that um, and had some construction in my background too. And I mentioned that because uh, it was really helpful for me to be able to bring together uh, a lot of these different aspects of agriculture to consider doing table grapes in a high tunnel. Um, and, and especially the fact that I spent a lot of time in greenhouses um, and am really familiar with the climate in there, uh, some of the challenges that come uh, with working in the greenhouse. It's, it's obviously totally different than any kind of outdoor production. Um, but really, my, my whole career is centered on uh, uh, growing grapes outside, and, and more specifically, wine growing in cold climates. Um, and that's really where I see the, the greatest potential for growth uh, in, in the grape industry for northern growers. Um, and, you know, so that's my crew there working in some tough conditions in the last real winter we had, uh, 2015. Um, and that's in the upper Hudson Valley there. But I couldn't help but wonder if there was a larger market for table grapes than for wine grapes, really. Um, you know, there, there's uh, obviously no age limitation on uh, the consumer with this product, and um, they, they have a really broad appeal. I feel like at one point I actually read that uh, table grapes were the most consumed fruit in the world. Um, you know, take that for what it's worth. So, uh, Wes Pollitt, um, if you can see my uh, uh, arrow here is uh, right about here. It's, it's in southwestern Vermont, um, about an hour north of Saratoga Springs and 45 minutes from Glens Falls. Uh, we are on the, um, the last river, the Medway River, to actually drain into South Bay of the Champlain Valley. So um, I'm right on the New York border. We, we almost every year we'll see 25 below zero Fahrenheit in our area. Uh, the last year or two, we haven't seen that. Um, but uh, we're a cold climate location. Our growing season is from May through September. In a good year outdoors, we can get to the third week of October. Um, but we, we don't count on that every year. Um, and we get about 2,400 growing degree days Fahrenheit. Uh, that can go up to about 2,600 and drop as low as about 2,200 seasonally, uh, at least what I've been watching over the last 15 or so years here. And, uh, you know, we're, as the crow flies, only about 100 and maybe 20 miles from the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Maine there, but we don't see any kind of moderating effect, obviously. Um, because of the mountain ranges in between us and the ocean, we're too far south of the lake to have any moderating effects from water. So for us, it's really about site selection. A uh, little bit about my area here. Um, you know, Vermont's a very small rural state with 650,000 people. Um, but, you know, being part of the greater New England, New York area, I count ballpark of 20 million people within 250 miles of my farm. Um, looking more specifically in my area, we have a pretty strong buy local movement here with some really well developed markets, especially in the Burlington area, uh, which is our biggest city. Mind you, it's only 60,000 people there. Um, we really don't see any uh, commercial grape production in New England. You know, I, I put anyone larger than a couple acres, but I might have been being a little generous there because I really don't know anybody with more than a few rows of table grapes. Um, of course, in New York, that's a different story as you get to the western part of the state and, and possibly down in uh, the southern Hudson Valley. Um, but uh, in Vermont, we have, you know, all the variability you can think of, uh, we, but, but there are some really good soils here and we do have some good access to water in places too. So um, table grape growing obviously is centered around uh, California. And um, there's a, a really good reason for that here in the Northeast. We, we've just got so many risks that are associated with any type of farming, uh, but really specifically with, with grape production. Um, you know, you name it, you can go down the list there on the left, or you could uh, probably add another dozen things to that list that could 
really be a deal breaker when it comes to growing high quality table grapes here or wine grapes for that matter. Uh, we also have some really high land and operating costs and um, not a lot of really suitable cultivars for our area either. And again, I'm in the colder portion of, I think, the listening audience today where we can go beyond 20 below zero. Um, so Somerset Seedless is, is our most reliable outdoor table grape. And, and we can generally see four to five tons an acre on that. Um, but there are a lot of production challenges that come along with that as well. Um, you know, and lastly, there's a real lack of knowledge about how to produce high quality table grapes. So this is what I did. Um, my, my idea was to be very honest with myself, um, as I am with growers that I work with in our nursery, about identifying the risks associated with whatever we're doing. And then, you know, trying to approach this in a way that, that we can mitigate those risks. And so I wanted to find out um, a little bit more about uh, protected viticulture production techniques. Uh, I wanted to learn what the potential climates can be in an unheated high tunnel in Vermont. Um, we, we do have a lot of wiggle room there to produce actually several different climates, depending on how many inputs we want to, uh, to go with on this. And I also wanted to know if it could be scaled up into a profitable and viable business model. But it, it, it's really worth noting that because of my nursery operation, you know, that's our full-time work. We have, we have five full-time employees seasonally uh, that help us with that. I have a lot of infrastructure in place, including refrigerate, a big refrigerated storage area. Um, we, we have um, tractors and equipment to prepare land. We can put in trellis. Um, we, we have a lot of the overhead covered in, in approaching this very small project uh, relative to the scale of our greater farm. So here's a couple of the goals that I had for myself. Um, I wanted to maintain a very high level of control over the growth and maturation of the vines and fruit regardless of the outside weather. And that's really key. And that's, that's a big ask here in, um, in Vermont. We also wanted to grow something closer to a, a California crop. Uh, we, we wanted to get up into the 15 ton per acre ballpark. Um, you know, why not set the bar high? If, if we're going to go this far and do this project, uh, I thought we would just see what the upper end of the possibilities were. And to justify some of this, I knew that I needed to produce grapes with a very high eating quality and unique characteristics. And the best analogy to this for me that, that I think um, many people can associate with is the Honeycrisp apple. And when that came around, uh, it, it really changed the eating experience for people when it came to apples. Um, you know, it was crunchy. Uh, it was sweet. Maybe it doesn't have the most interesting flavor, but it was a very different product for apple growers to enjoy. And uh, I know more than one apple grower that said that, that growing tree fruit became, became fun again uh, when Honeycrisp was introduced. And, and now... We see whether it's in apples or grapes uh, or cherries across the country, there are breeding programs that are upping the ante on quality. And so I wanted to try to follow suit the best I could. So my first high tunnel that I put up, uh, one fourteenth of an acre under cover. It's a four season tunnel. Um, we got, uh, um, a pretty high peak on it. We're at a 16 foot peak. Um, inside of that, we put three rows of Geneva double curtain. I have electric, but no heat. And we did modify our trellis for uh, support wires to use horticultural fabric for winter protection, which I'll get a little more into in a few moments. Um, and we put bird netting over all the openings. So the roll up sides, the doors and the louvers. We put three varieties in there. Um, Jupiter and Gratitude come from the University of Arkansas breeding program and Vanessa uh, is from uh, the university, oh, it's from Ontario um, and the Vineland Research Station. Uh, Dr. Helen Fisher bred that one. Uh, these are all tender varieties for my area of Vermont. Vanessa can make it through up in Burlington, right on the lake. It can make it through the winter, but it's not the most productive vine. 
and Jupiter and gratitude would die to the ground every year in my area. Um, here's a shot from last spring, uh, just giving you another idea of what we put up with a high tunnel there, uh, one of my nursery fields in the background. We do have a very sandy, gravelly soil here. We, we have a lot of really excellent um, uh, site features. It's not perfect by any means, but we do have really great excessively drained soil. And we have the Meadowy River, which we irrigate out of, so we have uh, all the water that we need. Um, and you'll also notice that we, you know, this is sited close to barns and other infrastructure, so we can get electricity to it. And it's not out of sight, out of mind, somewhere else on the farm. This did bring a lot of new risks um, to our program that, that obviously we didn't have, or some we did have uh, with outdoor production, but, but some of these are unique to protected viticulture. Uh, wind and snow damage to the high tunnel. Uh, you really, if you're gonna get into this, it's, it's gotta be a very strong structure. Um, maintaining winter dormancy as a result of fluctuating temperatures inside the tunnel is critical. So um, we were not just controlling uh, climate in the summer, but also in the winter in there. And currently we do that all manually. Um, timing bud break um, goes along with that. Um, diffuse light, I don't know if that was as big of a deal. We get rodents in there just like you would outside. Um, you have irrigation management because with our tunnel, it's a four season tunnel, so uh, rain is never going to hit the inside of it. And so we are basically trying to learn from West Coast growers on this one and managing our soil for salt buildup uh, and fertility strictly through drip irrigation. But then on the outside of the tunnel, we have to account for drainage, that, uh, for water that sheds off of this structure. Um, there is a, I think I read one inch of rain would be about 2,500 gallons of water that's shed just to the sides of this structure. So, you, you know, you certainly wouldn't want to put one of these up on clay and having drainage tile on the outsides that can hit daylight somewhere downhill is, is really critical too. Um, this is a really big one and, you know, I can't uh, stress the very high investment um, that is associated with protective viticulture in the way that I approached it. Um, you know, one could easily spend over $100,000 an acre. To, to get into this. Um, and I, you know, I'll, I'll mention that there are a lot of greenhouse grown grapes in Northern China, in Sicily, in Israel, in South Africa. Uh, so I'm not completely reinventing the wheel here. The, the closest to what we're doing is happening in Northern China around the city of Harbin. Um, but I'm certainly investing a lot more in what I'm doing. Um, and, and, and again, this is, I look at this very much as an experiment. Uh, I'm not going out advocating for people to, to go and try this, but uh, it's something that I'm really interested in and I'm willing to invest a certain amount to learn what can happen. Uh, and there's certainly ways, uh, approaches that exist that could lower that number quite a bit. For example, a three season hay grove style tunnel uh, with hardy varieties like Somerset Seedless. Um, but you could use this tunnel to still mitigate a lot of risks and hopefully increase your crop size. So um, this is uh, a look at year three um, coming into, this was 2015 was my third year in production with this. That was uh, what I would call our last real winter that we've had. Uh, it was very cold and very snowy. And so I removed the horticultural fabric that is my winter protection inside of this tunnel, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. Um, on April 12th, uh, I had started some very heavy irrigation to fill the so soil profile before that. Um, and at this point, we, we simply closed up the entire tunnel uh, to artificially start our growing season. The sap and the vines started to flow immediately and bud break followed two weeks later. Um, my goal was to try and keep seasonal benchmarks inside the tunnel about two to three weeks ahead of, of the outdoor conditions. So just taking a step back, this is probably in March of that year. Uh, we had a lot of snow. Um, the high tunnel with the seedless grapes is on the right. On the left is one of our propagation houses for the nursery. 
But uh, that, the hip board that you see there is about six feet high. So we've got about three or four feet of snow built up along our side walls, and that's the highest or the most amount of snow that I would want to see built up before we get in and start managing that because um, a lot of uh, greenhouse structures and tunnels have collapsed from the sides in because of snow load, not necessarily from uh, the top. So here's a look in while we're venting the high tunnel on a sunny uh, March day here in, in Vermont. And what you see here is uh, geotextile fabric draped over the entire trellis. And so we cover three rows at a time with this material. Um, this is a very common practice in, in uh, vegetable production and, and some berry production. And we're just applying it to grapes here. I do have a, a little bit of a mechanized way to roll that up, but, but it takes three of us really to pull it out in uh, in the fall and then you know three of us hit it in the spring to to roll it back up on a reel but that provides us a substantial amount of protection inside the tunnel for our midwinter temperatures uh, which i'll talk about in one of the next slides i have had some vole damage in here um, we use a weed mat that covers the entire floor and uh, so what i did was just cut a little bit wider circle around each vine you can see the um, the original damage over here on the left and steel wool I just started to wrap around some trunks because that's about the only thing that a, a rodent won't chew through. Um, so this particular winter we hit uh, 20 below zero, actually 25 below zero outside. This is my minimum temperature uh, for that winter under the uh, reme and inside the tunnel on our coldest night we hit about uh, nine degrees Eight degrees above zero um, so that's that's really substantial and then you'll also see as we this is right after I began my growing season we can very easily spike the temperature um, you know up into the 90s here in early April and so that's also a concern when you're getting into uh, the midwinter and that's why we do a lot of venting um, I'm gonna be kind of picture heavy for a little while so I'll just run through it quickly but uh, Sap starting to flow, you know, some exciting moments as, as we got into year three here after such a cold temperature and, and seeing um, on this particular vine is Jupiter, seeing that we've got a crop coming. And, um, you know, we didn't lose a single bud in here um, after 25 below zero outside. And so here we are at the beginning of the growing season, just getting things started again in year three. We applied as much viticulture to this as you really could. Um, you know, that said, there's still a lot that I have to learn and, and I'm sure a lot of changes that we're going to do over the years, but I took some of the very best that I knew about growing grapes and just tried to apply it in here, keeping in mind that we couldn't invest all of our time and season into this very small project. But we did do a lot of shoot thinning. Um, I did early leaf pulling before bloom. In year three, I made two sprays in here, one pre-bloom and one post-bloom to control black rot, downy and powdery mildew, uh, and that gave me full season control. Um, one uh, interesting note here is that without free moisture on the leaves, which is, that's not really realistic because there is condensation and some other things that do put some moisture on those leaves, powdery mildew should be the only disease that we have to control in there. And I'll get to what we did with that in year four that, that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, but we do shoot combing and skirting and uh, a lot of irrigating and fertigation going on. Uh, fruit set was excellent. Here we are looking at Vanessa. Um, you know, this is year three, kind of just moving right along. Uh, this is a, an early cluster of gratitude right here, which is a very new green seedless grape, uh, again from Arkansas. So looking down uh, the tunnel, one thing that, that we ran into right away that I'm gonna try to point out here is that on the left, um, you've got an outside row, um, middle row, and then another outside row all the way to the right, which you can't see. Um, and pay attention to these first couple panels of vines here because the variety changes as you move into the back. But I immediately saw a big difference in vigor on my outside rows compared to my inside rows. and um, you know, I, I sort of directly attribute this to 
uh, the roots of these outside rows uh, reaching out and getting more moisture from the edge of that tunnel and also some water leaching in from the outside there. Um, so what I did in year three was actually put in an extra drip line here for the middle row and uh, I did a little more focused fertigation on that side to try and deal with some variable vigor inside the tunnel. But this is awful good growth for year three, I think. Um, that said, we had some variable ripening. Uh, as you can see here, one vine uh, next to another with very different stages of uh, ripening going on. And I found that almost directly related to crop size. So I, you know, the, the heavier the crop that you hold on an individual vine, the, the slower it's going to ripen. And um, that was very easy to see. So fine tuning the, the crop and getting it more uniform is um, you know, part of the challenge that I'm gonna take on over uh, you know, the next couple of years here. Uh, the early ripening period, um, about a month after verasion, uh, we, were, we were getting close to being able to harvest some of this fruit. It was at 22 bricks with good color, but as I mentioned, because of the variability, we still had some at 10 bricks. Um, the color development was really slowing down at the end, so I did do some more leaf pulling. And then it, this was a little bit of a hard pill to swallow, but uh, one of my neighboring vineyards, um, well, a little ways up the road, started to harvest their outdoor Somerset seedless the day before I began to harvest my indoor grown Vanessa. And so, I was a little bit let down thinking that I just went through an incredible expense and a lot of effort to in, in one way get an earlier crop than a grower would outdoors. Um, but there was one sort of redeeming quality to that day. It was pouring rain outside when I began the harvest and I was picking this, this fruit that was dry and in beautiful condition inside. Uh, that said, I had to do what um, well, I had to do selective harvesting, really. And so this took a lot of passes. I was picking based on sugar and color, um, which you know are largely the parameters that we're looking at for table grapes, leaving out measurements of acidity and whatnot. Uh, here we are, uh, kind of an overhead view, looking down um, at the three rows of Geneva double curtain. Um, it's a uh, it's a labor intensive. Uh, training method, but but this because we did this, I think we we're able to uh, um, extend the the potential yield of our tunnel. So here's a look at a pretty heavily cropped vine in year three. Um, you know, uh, I know that I overcropped this, but we we did it anyway. Uh, it's worth noting the difference between that and a vine right next to it with a you know, not a, a vastly different crop size, but there is a different size crop on this relative to the size of the vine. And so you can see the difference in, in color going on there between these two. A um, few more ripening shots, you know, things were looking pretty good. I do get uh, pretty nice quality fruit in there and, and I have not done a heck of a lot of manipulation yet, which I'll talk about in a minute, but part of growing fruit, uh, any kind of crops in high tunnels, it's, uh, it's a very favorable environment. So we can, we, we generally are seeing things come in in larger quantities and larger sizes than an outdoor production. But part of that is also because I'm, I've got such a fine tuned approach to, you know, fertilizer and water. Um, but cluster of Vanessa coming in at just over half a pound, um, unfortunately, again, not all of them ripening at the same time. Um, and that, that turned out not to be the worst thing in the world uh, for us to be picking over a long period of time um, when it comes to our marketing approach, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, I'll also mentioned we got some really interesting color to Vanessa here. Uh, it's, it's certainly different than Vanessa you see grown outdoors. It was uh, a lighter color. Uh, people don't mind that too much. Um, here's another cluster at the same level of ripeness as this. These are both at about 22 bricks. You know we've got more orange colors here. It was different but they were delicious and sweet and crunchy. Um, some shots of gratitude. Um, 
that was a, a very productive grape that's that's actually crossed with Thompson seedless so we're getting one pound clusters out of that uh, which is is great when we're packing into one pound clam shells another shot here to give you some perspective uh, this was Jupiter year three um, I almost pulled it out because I was so unimpressed with it. Uh, I, I really let too big of a crop hang on this one. I heard it pretty good. It's the only one I saw bud damage on the following year uh, because of the crop size. But I had substantial bunch stem necrosis going on. Um, another shot of it here where it's, it's very predictable. It kind of started in the, in the bottom half of the cluster and then came down. And, uh, and this all just rots and falls off. And I, I really didn't harvest any fruit out of the Jupiter in year three. Um, I'll mention quickly that that came around in year four this past summer, and everybody I gave that fruit to just loved it. So we're gonna we're gonna keep it around. So in year three, I started harvest on August fifteenth, and I finished on October twentieth. And that's really just looking at at Vanessa, which is the main crop in there. And to give you an idea of how that selective harvest and variability and ripening affected me, um, I just took advantage of it and, and we, we, we picked for each store the day before that, that they were going to take it. Um, again, I do have refrigerated storage, so everything was cooled immediately after picking. And I sold these, uh, I wholesaled them to high-end grocery stores. Uh, I did bring them to farmer's market for a little while as well because we had some other crops going there off of the farm. Um, year three, we got the equivalent of nine and a half tons per acre on Vanessa. So I was feeling pretty good that, that we could even turn this up a little bit and, and really start approaching some California level yields on this. And, um, you know, we're, I, I knew that I was having a, a negative effect on the vines by doing this, but um, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained, I guess, was, was my perspective here. Again, not something that I would go out and encourage a lot of people to do uh, on any significant scale because there's a lot of risk associated with that. Um, so we got a great price. Our wholesale deliveries went twice per week. Uh, we got $4 a pound from these high-end grocery stores. They're, they're kind of like uh, Whole Foods. Um, uh, or Honest Weight uh, down in uh, uh, Albany area. Um, and so, and this was up in Burlington, Vermont. And, and so one of these stores took that and then retailed it for $7.79 a quart. And they sold it really well. Um, it's a high price. There, there's likely a limit on how much fruit can be sold at that price. But I don't know what that limit is. Um, and just, uh, I guess, quickly here, um, with the with, with those different shades or those different colors of Vanessa that I was getting, they certainly had the appearance of, of maybe not being all ripe. Even though they all had uh, very consistent sugar levels and flavor, um, and it, it certainly looked different than what other people were seeing in the stores. And so I made this comment to one of the buyers that uh, our sunset colored grapes were ready this week, and they just ate it right up. And, um, you know, so I, I just tried to accentuate the positive, if you will, uh, of what was going on, um, rather than trying to make excuses for my different colored grapes. Um, a quick look at year four. Um, I had some frost damage in there. I started things out pretty early. Uh, I, I went for about four or five days earlier to begin the growing season. And uh, outside temperatures in early April or mid-April shot down to the low 20s one night. Uh, I hit 31 degrees inside. Sorry about that phone going in the background here. Um, and uh, so I did have a little bit of frost damage that night, um, which surprised me. Uh, I also pruned to a very high bud count uh, this past year to try and move that needle up a little bit on the yield. Um, I adjusted my irrigation to longer sets and more of them. Um, I did a lot of fertigation to create a large vine in order to support this large crop because that's really the only way to get a bigger crop is to have a bigger vine um, that can support it. And then this is the interesting uh, approach I took in an effort to see how close to organic production we could get 
with these table grapes. Uh, I used no fungicide on the pre and post bloom period um, to test this idea of no free water on the leaves, meaning that I would have no black rot and possibly no downy mildew. Uh, and that powdery mildew would be my only uh, um, uh, issue. And then to manage that, I would close up the greenhouse uh, about twice a week and let the temperature spike over 105 degrees um, for a couple hours in there so that the, the whole canopy heated up. And in theory, that's supposed to um, kill most powdery mildew. Um, so I, I gave it a shot. I, I, I didn't test this in any scientific way, but I also had absolutely no powdery mildew uh, all season long. Um, here's my canopy after fruit set this past year. Uh, you can see that um, the vines that I was struggling to get vigor on, I, I did get better vigor, but it's, you, know, you can still see through them a little bit where the outside rows were still a little more vigorous. Um, so this is uh, uh, the full canopy. We're getting the vines bigger. Um, this is right before combing and the second leaf pulling that took place. So I did pull leaves once right before bloom. Um, and then we let the shoots uh, elongate and, um, and then I, I go in there and start separating them all and combing them down. A quick look after leaf pulling. Uh, really trying to expose the clusters. You can get an idea here of uh, how big a crop I held in year four. Um, here's what it looks like after the vines are combed and leaf pulled and they are skirted as well. So I'm not letting any shoots get away from me here and run 20 feet long. I'm really focusing the energy of each vine. Um, and, and, you know, that's a huge crop that I'm trying to hold in there. Um, I'll tell you right now that I overdid it. Um, one of my goals for next year is really to, to cut that back and to keep more of a two-dimensional plane of fruit uh, because fruit touching front to back is very problematic from a, a lot of perspectives in, uh, versus fruit touching side to side, if hopefully that makes sense to people. Uh, another look at too big of a crop, but um, you know, an effort to manage it uh, very effectively. So as this big, beautiful crop was ripening up, um, first of all, I saw that, that it was taking a lot longer to ripen. No problem, I thought. I'll call the stores, let them know, and we'll just keep this going through October and I'll still be able to sell all of it. Uh, about two weeks before I started harvest, a lot of the clusters began deteriorating. The year before, I, I definitely ID'd great berry moth in the tunnel and um, I did not spray for it in year four. Um, and I, so I started to see this damage. And then uh, immediately after that, the yellow jackets were swarming all over the high tunnel. And um, I was getting pretty concerned here. So I, I killed the yellow jacket nests on the outside of the tunnel and, and went in there and began to uh, by hand um, bury thin clusters. Uh, or whole clusters on the vine to remove any damage and I began to spray pesticide to deal with this. Uh, a late approach, but you know, again, I, it was something I could do. And after about a week of doing this, which was some 30 hours or so of, of uh, really smelly work, you know, at this point we, we certainly had some sour rots and a, a lot of acetic uh, acid um, in the grapes, so it smelled like vinegar in there. Um, I was working and a male spotted wing drosophila landed on my hand and I had the aha moment of what was going on here. Um, so right here you can see damage uh, from spotted wing drosophila. This is on Vanessa. Um, once they got into this especially heavy crop, even after I began spraying pesticide, I couldn't get the penetration that I needed to knock this population back. And I had uh, no traps set up, so I was, I was too late in realizing what was happening. Here's a close-up of a berry that's been, um, you know, stung by a female and had uh, the eggs laid inside. You can see the, um, the, th this is the entry wound here, and a lot of times there'll be a dew drop that comes out of that. And then you'll see this line of color 
um, variation in the berry. Um, that's because in, in the inside there is just starting to fall apart. Um, so in the end, I only sold a few hundred pounds of very hard-earned fruit this year. Um, I really didn't want to risk the reputation of our, of our farm on one ugly package of damaged fruit uh, that was going out to the store. And so consequently, I harvested um, contained, meaning I, I harvested into basically plastic lined bins and brought to a dumpster 90% of the crop um, and just threw it out. And, and again, this is not my main business. It's a fraction of our farm's business. So I could absorb that no problem in the name of educating myself. Um, but these are the kind of risks that, that people should be well aware of if they're considering getting into table grapes, because there are things that can really turn your season around very quickly. Um, and all three varieties that I have in there were affected. So for this next year, I'm gonna remove the bird netting that we currently have in place along the roll-up sides, the louvers and doors, and replace it with insect netting that's rated for spotted wing Drosophila. Uh, we'll build a vestibule with a double door. Uh, I have to say thank you to Laura McDermott and others at Cornell for putting together that SWD workshop in 2006, no, 2015, I guess it was, um, which I attended and, and left me somewhat prepared for when this was going to come. Um, I'll mention that in 2015, I had absolutely no SWD damage. The fruit was as clean as possible from the beginning to end. So this insect came in and um, infested, uh, uh, I guess, you know, I don't, I'm hesitant to say the farm, but uh, certainly the high tunnel um, in, in one year's time. And uh, so I'll set traps next year as well, and I'm going to try to throttle back that crop size to allow better penetration of any spray material that we might have to use. Uh, a couple other things I might want to get into in the next year or two are to more uh, automate my climate control. Uh, currently, we just have manual roll-up sides and venting and whatnot. Um, I could invest some more money, uh, you know, a few thousand more dollars and, and take this to, to the next level. That includes building a solid spread, uh, excuse me, a solid set spray system, which I think is um, a really uh, a progressive idea and, and has a lot of applications within high tunnels. Um, you know, I, I look at Cornell and Michigan State University and Washington State University for a lot of research on that. Um, I may do some cluster thinning or cluster manipulation in this coming year and um, always trying to figure out what my best temperatures are going to be for color development. So trying to get uh, you know, a good diurnal shift in temperature I think is going to help me, meaning we can't leave this high tunnel closed up all night long and keep it hot in there. Um, it, it may behoove me to shoot for higher temperatures in the daytime and cooler temperatures at night um, to even out my ripening. And of course, I'm, I'm uh, open to any suggestions or comments um, from, from all of the very talented people that are here participating in this right now, um, because it's, you know, we, we really have the opportunity to, I think, put our heads together and, and figure out some interesting ways to to uh, try out some, some new crops and some new markets. I'm gonna leave you with um, <laughs> another disastrous moment in high tunnel growing history. Um, I've got probably 20 years of greenhouse growing under my belt for myself or for other people. And still um, there are times when things can go wrong. So this was in 2015, um, a hurricane was coming up the coast. This was in uh, early November. And so you can see inside the high tunnel, everything was harvested and the vines were senescing nicely. Um, and we had some 70 mile an hour winds coming through. And those winds found one weak spot in the high tunnel uh, to get some, some air into there. And it, it slowly weakened, uh, excuse me, weakened. And within an hour or so, uh, we had um, the entire high tunnel plastic flapping up in the air. It took two of us a little while to get it back down, but I, I did compromise the film that year, and so we had to replace that plastic. Um, you know, another added expense uh, to, to add on to that budget. Uh, but that's where I'll end it right there. Um, thank you all for your time and listening, and um, 
you know, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Andy. That was really interesting. Um, I had no idea you've been doing that for so long, so that's great. Um, I'm looking at the chat box. I'm not seeing any typed in questions, but I'm just wondering if um, people do have questions and want to unmute themselves. We can attempt this. We have a pretty small group. Uh, we're missing about 20 of the people that registered, so I'm not sure where they are, but right now we have a group that's manageable. I think if you do have a question, you could unmute yourself and just attempt to um, ask that question of, of Andy or any of the speakers that we've heard today. Okay, I think, and I, I do want to reassure those of you who are newbies at Great Production, um, we are going to, th this was kind of a planned, you know, we did some beginning stuff and then we had a farmer talk about what he's looking at. So there's, there's a lot of potential, a lot of excitement, I think, in this crop or what there should be. And, um, you know, we, we got a realistic view from growers and extension people alike. And next, the next two sessions are going to be kind of, we'll step back again and try to look at the cultural concerns, kind of at the more beginning, beginning steps that you should take to be successful. And George Hamilton from the University of New Hampshire is going to teach um, next session, next week's again at 11 a.m. on Friday. And then the following session, we'll have um, some extension professionals and another grower talk. So unless I hear some questions and unless uh, I get something typed in, and I'm going to make sure that you guys get the uh, information. Oops, somebody unmuted. So does somebody have a question? Can you hear me? Just barely, but go ahead. I, I'm just wondering, um, I'm interested in trying to do table grapes organically. So I'm just wondering, you know, not necessarily today, but over the course of the sessions, if people um, want to speak to that or, or have thumbs up, thumbs down kind of uh, response to, to the possibility of doing organic production. Um, Andy, do you want to make a comment on that? I think that the extension educators will certainly try to address that during presentations the next few sessions, but you might want to comment on that from your perspective. Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, there's a lot of challenges for organic grape production in the Northeast, and, and I guess the one that, that most people focus on as most difficult to get past is black rot. Um, there are just no suitable products um, out there right now that can handle black rot organically. Um, and then the other side of that is that the number of products available to you to control any of the fungal issues um, are, are really limited. So you're basically down to sulfur and copper and maybe oxidate um, or, or ozone. And, and that gets really tough. Um, so that's why I, I, I kind of looked at the high tunnel here as a possibility to, to do that organically. Uh, I'm not there yet, um, but you could do, you know, something really simple like a hay grove tunnel. And the idea there is just removing free moisture from the vines, from the leaves of the vines. Um, but, but yeah, organic growing of grapes is extremely difficult here in, in the Northeast, I guess is the bottom line. Laura, you're muted in case you're trying to talk to us. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Trying... Sorry, I, I, I was muted. Now, we heard you, Lori. I, I was the one who was trying to share my screen and give a presentation. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody that next week we're going to be talking about more of the cultural perspectives, and then the third week is the 
um, fertility management and pest management considerations. So I'm sure we will talk more about the organic um, perspective. So does anybody else have any questions? Um, Jim, Liz, and especially a Andy, I really appreciate your uh, participation in this webinar. And I will be in touch with all of you with handouts, et cetera. And thank you so much and have a great weekend.